It was a Sunday night, we were watching a movie. The phone rang and we just decided we weren't going to answer it. The next morning I checked the message and there was um, Tracy on the line and um, that's when her life changed. I got to the door and it had been shot out and got in the house. The walls were pre peppered with, with shot and there was a, a huge pool of blood on the floor. The light had just gone. This bubbly friend was not there anymore. Yeah. Some days I'd wake up from these night terrors and have to comb my hair and put my clothes on and go to work and be with other people who uh, I felt had no idea who they were dealing with because I didn't know who I was dealing with. I don't think she was fully aware of the level of trauma that she'd experienced for the past three years. You know, how do we know how we're going to cope with trauma? None of us know. We don't know another person's story. I'm Tracy Perrow and uh, have had a long and interesting career and have lived and worked around the world. And I've been at Providence Farm since 2016. And in 2018, I uh, took the position of executive director. I would describe Providence Farm as uh, a place for community inclusion for all individuals who might have difficulty assimilating into what might be called normal society. It's a therapeutic community and it provides services to people with vulnerabilities. Tracy right from the beginning came in with a focus on what our mission's all about and she would read through dry boring palsy and bylaws but with the point of reminding us to keep focus on that mission. I refer to her quite often as a warrior. She is a visionary. She will do everything within her power or ability to promote what she believes is right. In the case of Providence Farm, she is an extraordinary advocate for the potential of the farm. There was so much to do here. She was busy all the time and there was um, not a spare moment, but she loved it. You could tell that she was really enjoying the, the whole process of getting things organized and she's so capable. She bought a house. Um, she didn't know where to start, so I spent time um, shopping with her, I painted some pictures for her walls. Do you like this? Yeah, I love it. And it was all based on blues and yellows, the ocean, the sun. Yeah. The next morning, I realized there was a message on the um, answering machine. And it was Tracy, and, a, and her voice was not her normal voice. And um, so I phoned back immediately and she told me that um, she had experienced a violent home invasion. When I arrived, there was evidence of a weapon obviously having been fired. With the full intent of, of killing her. We sat down and she told me everything that went on. Uh, it's a little difficult to talk about because I knew the person and um, it was uh, tragic from beginning to end. We were deeply shocked with, with the outcome. Tracy has had 
experience as a police officer, and I think she pulled up her instincts so that it didn't come to what it could have. Um, she was in total shock. Pretty much a walking zombie. I'm shocked about the, the condition of the house when I was there, that she didn't have more support to, to help clean it up. It, it took days. I, I couldn't believe it. I said, come and stay with me in our spare room for as long as you want. She decided she did not want him controlling her life. She didn't want him pushing her out of her home. So she decided to stay, and uh, God knows how she did it. I did attempt to carry on as if nothing had happened. Um, and I suppose that was uh, the stoic in me believing, A, that nothing was wrong, but B, that uh, the work had to, had to go on. In fact, I had returned to work a week after. I think she tried her utmost to be normal. Thought, okay, well, Tracy's back to work. She's fine, she's good to go. You know, that's it. And we probably did not give her as much support as we should have. In hindsight, we probably did not do a very good job of supporting her in her re-entry into the workplace. It probably will be handled way better in the future. But there's always that first person who's got to, you know, break through in order to have some sort of standardized protocol. But uh, the courage to do it, and, uh, the strength to carry it through and to be that first person, yeah, it set her back initially. Thereafter, a huge decline occurred for me and, and a cutting off of, of my relationships with other people, a withdrawal into myself, a deep, deep sadness that um, overtook my life. Being alone in my house, frightened into wakefulness, is really the definition of, of darkness, I would say. Screaming would wake me up, just this unearthly screaming. and. Uh, I would wake up and realize that the screaming was me. It became um, quite challenging to be intellectually engaged at my work and psychologically and spiritually frozen, which is how I felt. Uh, yet that's how I continued for a number of years. And I know that I had said a couple of things at work which uh, surprised or shocked a few of my co-workers. And I believe it was when I saw that surprise or that shock in their eyes that I realized things were not well with me. Crime victims had contacted me and given me a list of, uh, of counselors. So I, I actually just went down the list and phoned up counselors and said, I, I think I need some help. What is PTSD, right? And all those fancy words, post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD, without being clinical, is really a response to something horrible. That for whatever reason, we are not permitted in our own minds to make sense of. PTSD sets in and hijacks our brains to not allow us ever to settle. It sits as a companion, unwelcomed most times, uh, and waits for opportunities to present itself. Even when I am in my office and I hear a loud clanging noise, somebody drops a glass or something like that, I feel startled, my heart starts to race, my hands start to sweat, in the sense that there's an attack happening, a whole rush of physiological experiences happen. She has auditory disruptions that can dysregulate her for the remainder of an entire day. Tracy will um, oftentimes stand at her computer and lose her balance. I think one of the big things that people don't understand about having PTSD or having had trauma is that it really brings people into these shutdown modes, right? Mm -hmm. They forget how to use their body and their balance and their coordination. And then as we build them up, the confidence starts to come, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
One, two, mm -hmm. three. Good. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Basically, when we started working together, uh, lots of fear, reaction, fear, behavior, stress, anxiety, all of those things. I used to be formerly a very quick, verbally capable individual, and suddenly I was halting in my language and stuttering or slurring even and sounding impaired with complete, sometimes dropouts of memory where I couldn't even recall something that had happened that morning. And then a lack of confidence sets in, which then worsens the whole cycle. And that became protracted and lasted all the way to now. You know, as someone who, who has a job that involves being, <laughs> being socially engaged, she really was struggling with that. Because if you don't have that level of social engagement, that's that's the basis of who we are as humans. I'm really appreciative to you because I remember when I first came in here, I didn't even realize I was that, I don't know if the term is yeah. messed up, but I didn't realize where I was. I, I, I can't even believe the eyes, right? Yeah. <laughs> what they, you know, yeah. what they used to look like and how, how afraid they used to look, right? Yeah. And now we're in this state where you're giving good eye contact to me, your nervous system's calm, you can engage, right? The eye contact, the communication, yeah. right? You're not, right? I can actually laugh with you. I know. Remember, <laughs> before it was just crying. I know, right? Just crying, yes. Yeah. I was required to be off work for three and a half months initially, and I've had some setbacks since then, and I've had more um, medical restrictions on my operational work. She works a modified schedule that allows her one day a week to see the series of her interdisciplinary support team. So I went from seeing a clinical counselor once a week to also a physiotherapist, an occupational therapist, a vestibular therapist, and a kinesiologist, and then seeing other specialists, including a neuro-ophthalmologist and a neuro-optometrist. In November, I added up that I'd been through four surgeries and over 112 hours of counseling, and it, it's almost like it becomes a job in and of itself. Did I show you the video of what it was like in the van when I went to um, the Victoria appointment? No. no. Uh, I was totally triggered in that. As you're going down the highway on the left side of the mountain, mm -hmm. and the way the sun filters through the trees, right. it's. Da -da 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 with light dark, light dark, light dark, yeah. light dark, the whole way. And it was like a strobe light. And I was like, okay, this isn't good. <laughs> so I shut my eyes. But you shut your eyes and you're in the moving vehicles and, and so the nausea. So when I got to the appointment, I was already triggered and unwell. I don't know if I told you, but I was bawling. I was crying my pants off. <laughs> On my trip home, um, I was so ill that the rest of the day I spent curled up in a ball. I can't say that I actually have friends right now. I've been relatively incapable of recognizing my own mental illness. So to be able to characterize it to other people was beyond my capacity. So I don't even know if I've made any explanations to people. I just simply dropped away. On occasion, I would find myself looking out the window at the other people and thinking to myself, if they can get dressed and can pull themselves out of their depression or their tremendous challenge and get on that bus or in that car to come here with their face mask on, if they can do that, I can show up. To me, it's an awakening of, of sensitivity on all levels for another individual. And the awakening of that sensitivity is, is a flowering of compassion. Because we're human, we're also gifted with, with a loving capacity. So if we can marry that loving capacity with the recognition of the deep sadness, sometimes the tragedy of what it is to be human or on a human experience, then one has an awakening of sensitivity. And that sensitivity is what I would suggest is the basis for all trauma-informed practice. For me, trauma-informed practice is basically meeting the person where they're at, figuring out what they need, and then helping them with those goals and skill sets. 
in a way that promotes safety, self-efficacy, opportunity for choice. There are these different principles that are put into action that allow us to appreciate another person's debilitating experience and create an environment that promotes and allows them to heal without re-victimizing or re-traumatizing them. The timing is absolutely perfect because we've all experienced rupture and pain and grief in this pandemic, all of us. A lot of Tracy's vision to the future is promoted by her personal experience. And so anticipating, um, just for example, COVID and what will the effects of a global trauma collective, global collective trauma look like moving forward and as how she relates that to her own recovery and the importance of creating and establishing a trauma-informed practice. Yeah. So I think in her, in her um, vision about where to take the organization and I think the vision of, that the board has is for Providence Farm to be recognized as an organization that uses as its foundation the trauma-informed practice, to some extent kind of putting Providence Farm on the map. Some persons are diagnosed, some persons are not, but when we look at the, the fullness of a human experience from birth until wherever we are on, on our life's journey, we recognize that most people do experience trauma at some point in their life. I would say 100% of the persons who come to our organization have trauma that is not integrated or that they have not recovered from. When we think about trauma and creating uh, environments and experiences that are holistic, that are organic, that are healing, that are natural, we have 400 acres that promotes <laughs> that. So the land on which we were on contributes greatly to trauma-informed practice. Providence Farm has been the stoic pillar of safety for them, I think, during COVID, that should the rest of the world fall apart around us, there's this one constant, no matter what happens, no matter what happens, we have each other at Providence Farm. I guess there's still that big anxiety of, um, you know, losing my job. <laughs> it either works out because you've come a long ways. You have a ton of coping strategies. Yeah. Um, or at some point you get to that point where, you know, you've, you've said it lots of times, what is more important? Is Providence more important or is your health more important, right? Mm -hmm. And it may come to that. If I go back full time, uh, I, I would probably be very mindful of the boundaries uh, for how I could do, actually do it. After a long meeting that goes till eight in the evening, take the corresponding time off in the morning, I just would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fact that I've even said that to, to you, yeah. is that the first time you've heard it? I think so. It and probably and you know what's really funny, Tracy? You know how I said I, I did a presentation this morning? Yeah. Um, it was a case study. She was also in a, in a leadership position, but um, had also the people she reported to who are really concerned about her ability to do certain aspects of the job and WorkSafe we'd gone through a return to work plan and WorkSafe had um, we'd all deemed her that she's fit to do her whole job but there was still some concern from her superiors around certain aspects of the job but she actually stood up and she told them what I've come to learn through this whole process is I have a mental health condition and I likely will have it for the rest of my life. I've learned how to manage it, and I know that I can do this job capably. She says there are plenty of other administrators um, that have medical conditions that you accommodate and you support. I want the same from you. I expect the same from you. And she actually stood there and told them that. Uh, that's know. what I just tried to say. Especially if they had the concern that maybe she couldn't do all of the elements of her job and she's standing up for herself and saying she can. I think that's great. I don't think I've yet had the courage to say to any group anywhere, uh, I have a mental health condition. 
my conviction to stay in that position is so strong and I've not given up yet <laughs> and I don't intend to give up so then I should be able to to speak those uh, those words of strength out loud yeah it's not often that you would have a person in an ED position that was navigating trauma. For her to personally experience what it's like to feel defeated at times, what it feels like to be disconnected from community, for her to know all of those things personally will lend itself to her as an extraordinary leader. I, th I think that anybody who comes out the other end of mental trauma and has done the work you can't do that and not be courageous, which may allow her to share the story. By sharing the story, meet more people who have experienced something, and then you have the beginnings of a movement, and more people aren't hiding it, then it becomes less of a stigma and more of just, hey, I have a voice and uh, uh, I should be heard, and now it's we have a voice and we will be heard. Through Tracy's experience, She's going to change the way we, we, we look at trauma and already we're starting to work at that in this community and she is going to develop a space that really is forward thinking about the way we look and help people through trauma. Yeah. Yeah. The light's coming back. It is. It's been a long, slow, process, but um, she's a strong, strong person. Last time she did um, inform me that she's bought herself a single outrigger and she's so excited. Today I'm receiving my new OC1 canoe. Um, I'm going to go down to the compound because hopefully the, the fellows are there with, with my new canoe. With my new canoe. <laughs> so I'm really happy for her because that's, that's her, her passion. Paddling is, is very, very much a part of her life part of her escape, a part of her mental health. Um, you know, row, row, row your boat gently down a stream. And I think of water, <clears throat> water on, on stone, just gently, just letting all of your toxic uh, feelings and, and your, your heart, your heart can, can, blo can blossom here. And that's the wonderful thing about this community is whatever you're going through, somebody can relate.